Well, hello and welcome to today's Audit Tuesday. Um, as some of you may know, uh, the UATS podcast highlights developments in cyber and GRC. Um, today's episode uh, is about the extremely important change healthcare cyber attack, um, which as we know is significantly impacting the entire healthcare industry. And so to help explain the importance of this, we have cyber forensic expert, Greg Kutzbach uh, with us today um, and ex-forensic cop and now healthcare um, and cyber and GRC expert, Craig um, Guinasso. Um, Guinasso. <laughs> it's all good. Um, first of all, um, maybe Greg, can you just take a minute to um, introduce yourself to the Audit Tuesday audience? Uh, sure. Uh, owner of Exhibit A Cyber uh, out of Orange County, California. Uh, I've been doing technology for about 20 years and for about the last eight years I've been specializing in incident response, digital forensics and building enterprise cybersecurity strategy. Previous to that came from GRC, standing up enterprise environments. And now I really focus my time and effort on helping businesses uh, ha stop their preventable, preventable cyber incidents. Thank you, Greg. Um, Greg. Can you maybe take a minute to do the same and, and possibly cover some of your experiences as a forensic cop and who you might sure. get into? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So currently, I'm a senior director for technology and cybersecurity at a. Uh, elector. We're a small pharmaceutical company in South San Francisco, but my career really started in law enforcement. I was a police officer in the Central Valley for about 10 years and um, was able to get into forensic science, uh, specifically around uh, computer well, computer crime, although it was uh, not, not what we know it as today. Uh, I just happened to be at the right place at the right time and was able to transition from uh, doing forensic work um, in law enforcement to the private sector. Perfect. Okay. And uh, Carrie, you have graciously agreed to be host today. Can you tell the uh, audience a little about yourself? You, you have a great background in cybersecurity, GRC, and compliance. Sure. Uh, so I do have over 20 years of experience um, in electronic payments, regulatory compliance, risk management, as well as security program management. Um, I've held various cybersecurity advisory and GRC roles uh, at VMware, at Walmart e-commerce, Symantec, um, Wells Fargo and Visa. And recently I led a small research project related to cyber regulations for U.S. critical infrastructure for DHS during a uh, master's program I recently completed through NYU. Nice and congratulations. All right, Carrie, take it away. Start quizzing our, uh, our guest. Right. Um, can you give a quick overview of what this big change healthcare um, hack is all about? Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm just going to start off with a quote from the American Healthcare Association. Uh, this is the quote, the change healthcare cyber attack is the most significant and consequential incident of its kind against the U.S. healthcare system in history. For nearly two weeks, this attack has made it harder for hospitals to provide patient care. So that thing that summarizes it really well, but basically they started back on the hack started on February 21st. It, helped, it hit change healthcare and a whole bunch of its uh, partnered firms with the company, including uh, Optum and um, and Medicare. Uh, it's uh, it's huge. So Change Healthcare was purchased from um, from United Healthcare back in 2022 for 22 uh, billion. Um, and um, and yeah, so 21 days outage. They had to advance over two billion dollars during the during this. Uh, Congress had to release emergency funds. HHS had to put out financial support. Um, pharmacy operations, small firms are down. Um, uh, doctors can't keep their places open. And they're, they're they're tapping into their personal loans and personal funds. It's 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 enormous. Uh, I mean, the entire medical well being of America stands on. Uh, the insurance industry, and this is the largest player. It's uh, it, it's huge. Yeah, and let me just add something. Greg sent us a update this morning. He's, he's on top of this stuff. Uh, this was straight from an article he sent me this morning. The investigation adds to United Healthcare troubles. In February, it was reported the Biden administration was launching an antitrust probe into the insurers' business dealings and provider acquisitions. I'm like, wow, are there consequences to hacks, Greg? <laughs> Man, that's rough. Okay, keep going. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, your your healthcare practices that uh, everyone relies on. They can't pay rent. They can't pay. They can't pay bills. They uh, it threatens the viability of their practice. Uh, if you're if you're running a chemotherapy center, you can't pay your chemotherapy drugs for your patients. Um, and uh, and they're having to bankroll two months of expenses. And you've heard of these these drugs are tens of thousands of dollars a dosage. It's um, it's it's unsustainable. So um, so basically, it's a it's a hack that hit one company that just went lateral, 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 lateral all over the place. And, uh, and now it's, it's uh, endangering uh, patient records. It's uh, putting the entire pay payment system in jeopardy. Uh, it's causing just, just widespread damage. And it's, it's putting us back to those emergency situations that we had during, or the emergency measures that we had during, uh, during the pandemic that of course makes uh, all of us GRC type people just spin because it, we like process and this is basically saying forget process people are dying so it, it's it's super bad it's the worst ever um and uh, maybe just to continue this so craig now that you work in the private sector do you think that most enterprises are currently vulnerable to the same type of attack that this group caused to the change healthcare um, group I absolutely do, um, and I think especially the healthcare vertical, um, and I actually do have a little bit of experience in dealing with these um, these actors. Uh, and I'll and I'll say that um, you know I, I spent the last fifteen years or so in healthcare, and I mean the, the healthcare vertical is still the vertical using fax machines, so it doesn't surprise me at all that they're the ones most affected by this. Um, I, I have never seen um, a, a, a vertical that you know, has more devices in it and systems that, that come with this, uh, you know, war um, warning from the manufacturer, don't patch. You know, we, have, we haven't uh, tested these patches. So you have all these devices, whether they're uh, a medical device running, you know, uh, human samples or, or some other scanning tool that they may have um, that, that run off of a, a Windows machine and they don't want us to patch. They don't want us to patch because it may make their systems unstable. So you have all of these HIPAA covered uh, systems that they, that they don't want patched. So this doesn't surprise me one bit. And uh, Greg, maybe, um, so just a quick question for you. So the alleged culprits um, to this attack are not new to the game, right? They're pretty well known, is that correct? Uh, yeah, they, they, there's some history here. So, um, so Alpha V, um, it's, uh, they're, they're uh, is actually attacked by Nachi, which is an affiliate of Alpha, of Alpha V. Uh, and Alpha V was taken down by the FBI back in December, 2023. So just a little while ago, uh, just, just, um, decryption keys were distributed, basically big giant takedown. Um, and then that basically crushed them, which, uh, which then they, they, they're a business. So they say, okay, we need to get our marketing up. So they increase affiliate rates. Cause again, they are, they go out to ransomware affiliates to say, Hey, we'll pay you a higher commission on your ransomwares. I, I swear to God, this is horrible. Um, to 90% to encourage uh, a, a quicker regroup, the regroup of the growth. Yeah. And, and this, and this regroup has happened before. They used to be Black Cat, Black Matter, Dark Side. Remember, remember Dark Side, uh, Colonial Pipeline Hack 2021? Um, yeah, they just, they just reform and they just do their marketing. They do their, uh, their, their headhunting. It's, I mean, this is LinkedIn for bad guys. Um, so, uh, so anyway, um, uh, the FBI took them down. Two months later, Change Healthcare Hack happened. As of March 1st, if you look on their big uh, uh, website where it shows all of the proof of concept data from all the hacks, there's 20 companies on there. They are extremely active. And, um, and just as a note, there's a, there's a whole thing where, um, where Change Healthcare paid $22 million to them over Bitcoin. Uh, and then they said, sorry, we, uh, we didn't get the money. We, uh, we can't pay it. So then they, they screw the affiliate. The affiliate then uh, makes a big a big stink about it. So you basically you have this like this drama happening within the criminal underworld. No no honor amongst thieves, as they said. And uh, and then Black Cat Alpha V is uh, is shutting down. And they they say they already found a buyer for the ransomware source code. So uh, I just think the business of criminals is just absolutely uh, fascinating. It's uh, these are these are just bad people. They're just people. This isn't like some mysterious nation state sort of thing. This is 
this is a bunch of a bunch of people making a business. It's 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 horrible. Uh, and Garrett, uh, maybe you can share any insight on how they know that the attack originated from uh, Black Cat. Yeah, uh, one they often identify themselves, but also the, the just their mechanisms, their mechanisms of the attack. They're almost like signatures. They're the signatures. Oh, they attacked this. And it is manipulation. There's this malware. We've seen this malware before. And it leads up. And it's just obvious to all that it is the same group. Um, so much so that I just had our inside sales post on the LinkedIn um, um, uh, chat. You can see right there that CISA, uh, a group that we love here at UATest. We had Don Hester, an uh, a evangelist from CISA. On, on one of our uh, podcasts, CISA has released, released a stop ransomware, LV Black Hat, you know, uh, literally what action to take to mitigate, mitigate against their hacks. As Greg said, these guys are a company, right? I mean, whatever word we want to use in English language, they're a company. What really was cool about what Greg brought up early on is they have affiliates. They're the group, and then they say, okay, this affiliate... I want you to write the router hacking software. I want you to, you're good at the web server hacking software. You got that database stuff. You got the great way that we can obviously take Bitcoins. They have affiliates and they have arms and branches and they're, they work together to extract and to damage us and in Western uh, uh, companies for money. Yeah. So that's the answer to your questions is there, there are signatures and we posted something in the LinkedIn chat to help you identify these guys. Um, and Greg, maybe uh, can you talk? I know you mentioned it um, started to a minute ago, but maybe talk a little bit about some of the signature actions from from this group. Uh, sure. So they're they're pretty cutting edge. Uh, a lot of their tools are written in Rust. Um, they uh, they attack off of previously compromised user credentials to to uh, gain initial access into the environments. Uh, very very standard. Uh, once initial access is established, they use Active Directory to create and take over user and administrator accounts and compromise those. Uh, PowerShell Cobalt Strike, um, along with uh, Microsoft Sys internals, Windows administrative tools in order to get your lateral movement and get your teeth in there. Um, and then they use Task Scheduler to push a Task Scheduler to configure malicious group policies, which then um, use that to deploy ransomware. That's kind of their uh, MO. Um, and uh, switch over to, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm just going to add on to that that um, they they really like to attack NetApp as well as uh, Synology devices. So if you have those that are holding critical data, you know, make sure they're backed up. And don't don't forget uh, critical data on those devices is oftentimes the backup. <laughs> <laughs> That's exactly right. So, um, Craig, I'm going to just jump over to you for a second. I know um, you may have some experience um, with Black Cat. Is there anything that you can share with us at any level? Um, what what you yeah, absolutely. Um, it, you know, my my experience is that I I think we've had a paradigm shift now. You know, my entire career, which started in the very early '90s, um, in information security, was about defend, 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 and now I think it's it's shifted. It's not about defend. It's about recover, recover, recover. Like, just assume they're going to get in. Just assume they're going to do damage. How are you going to recover? How are you? And, and what's the fastest path to, to, you know, getting the business back on its feet and not having to pay that ransom? And, and so that's where I, I focus my time and where I would recommend people just focus. Just assume it's going to happen. Um, just like you have car insurance because you assume that at some point there's going to be a wreck, whether it's your fault or somebody else's fault. But you have a plan to, to, to recover the business as quick as possible. Um, and Greg, I know you're involved in incident response. Um, what is in general, what's your course of action in these types of cases, you know, after a breach has been identified? Sure. Uh, containment and remediation. Um, so gain fast visibility across the entire infrastructure to detect and respond any sort of lateral movement and deploying of the attacker infrastructure. Uh, you use what tools are in place in order to move fast where you can. You deploy what tools you need in order to effectively triage uh, thousands of endpoints across multiple environments, across multiple sub companies. It's you got to be able to roll out fast. Uh, you need to get visibility fast, and um, uh, and and then you have to make sure that business needs are met along with the technical needs um, of both the incident responders, the remediation team, and the various business units to keep that all um, uh, all together. Um, 
And really, after the breach, um, the focus is on making sure that the attackers aren't laying dormant in the, on the network, uh, making sure that uh, the key stakeholders of the company are uh, are kept in the loop the entire time, and making sure that we're in, that we're protecting critical processes and not just focusing on technology. Uh, your entire infrastructure might be uh, in shambles, but really, it's the uh, it's the processes and the assets that you're protecting, not the um, not the electronics. So, Greg, um, can you also talk a little bit about how important it is, or, or maybe not so much, but I think it is, of having these relationships in place before the attack, like having you on a retainer or knowing who to call when something happens. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, sure. Um, so you'd be amazed at how much time is wasted at the beginning of a, an incident response uh, just to say, so tell me about your company. Uh, can you tell me what you do? Can you tell me uh, what assets you have? Can you tell me where those are, are kept? Do you have a network map? Do you have an asset map? Do you have a data map? Uh, do you have all these? Our, you know, you, you could blow a whole day of just talking and trying to understand what you're trying to recover from before you even get started. If you already have relationship, relationships in place, that means that a lot of these conversations have already, already been had with uh, table topping, with uh, incident response preparation, disaster recovery preparation, um, again, if the whole place is on fire, you need to be able to prioritize. And uh, those communication pieces um, are critical and they're also slow. Um, so having things ready ahead of time is, is money extremely well spent, time extremely well spent. And, and just to be super clear, this isn't the responsibility of IT. This is the responsibility of all key stakeholders, all key departments within the company, because it, the company is ran from all the departments. That means everyone's input needs to happen on this disaster recovery and incident response planning uh, phases. And, uh, and then outside companies like uh, like Exhibit A, um, they need to be part of that conversation too. Everyone's on the same page. This is, business is about communication. Good communication makes everything work or fail. It's really up to prep. Hey, Carrie, I got to jump here because that was great what Greg said. That the, the what how Craig asked it. You got to have this stuff in place, right? You got to have your incident response guy in place. And in addition, I will uh, selfishly add that you have you have to have your me mechanisms to do access discovery in place, right? I mean, so great, we got breached on X resource. All right, who the hell has access to that? Okay. You should have in place a mechanism that you can just say, okay, this is what we do. We're going we're to check right now who has access to us, and we're going to quantify this. We could do this. If that mechanism, like a UA test, isn't in place that you can, you can audit, you can govern every single application, every single thing, be it a service count, be it an application, be it an internal or external application, if you can't do it immediately, how are you going to engage? How are you going to work with Greg and say, hey, Greg, rock and roll. We got breached here, right? But here is the access to these. We got to look at, you know, what the access that we got to see what we locked down. If the mechanism is in place before that happens, and, and Greg, uh, Craig, this is your life, right? If the mechanism isn't in place, Craig, then it's got to be building the bridge first before you get the army across the river. I just want to add that if I went into an incident, and there was a and there was a platform like you attest in place. Um, the reliance of attackers on um, escalating privilege, so taking a privilege that was at level A and now is at level B, and I could see show me what users have changed in a very quick way, uh, and not having to rely on digging through Active Directory or um, or Intra or Okta. And, and have it to pull together all these logs from all these places. If I could just get that visibility, that would be absolutely beautiful. Yeah, yeah, there we go. And, and, and just as a note, you, you attest does that. You can just uh, you can just say what's changed. That's, that's that. <laughs> Thank you, Greg. Yes, I should have said it. That's what it does, access discovery, and Craig uses it as well. Take it away, Carrie. So, uh, Craig, um, you did forensics for the police. Um, yep. Can you maybe talk a little bit about what that was like and um, maybe uh, explain what the first steps to of a forensic that a forensic office takes during some uh, kind of an incident when it occurs? Yeah, honestly, it really started back then out of um, 
I hate to say this, but it was really a lot based on, you know, child pornography. That's what really got uh, the law enforcement to, to figure out ways that they could get access to, um, to computers. But then, um, you know, we, you know, in our case, we, um, we had instances on, on our university where grades were being changed and, um, and, and a lot of it was really just unnecessary access. Uh, and, and back then it was very, um, I mean, it was sophisticated at the time, but looking back on it, it was very rudimentary, right? It was about making sure you took um, really good steps when you, when you found the system, whether it's a, a laptop or a desktop, to, to not, uh, not change anything, take a forensic image of that, and only look at, the, only look at the, uh, the forensic image. And, you know, I look back at some of the stuff we did with having to plug in the cables and all that stuff now that you wouldn't even really think of doing. I mean, I guess it still happens, but nowhere near as much as it used to. Um, and then being able to formulate that information and put it um, in a report like if you're looking at thousands of bits of data that you then have to put into a report and then testify to that report, and you're you're actually talking to you know to to judges and to defense attorneys and to jurors that have no idea what you're talking about. It's it's just like so far out there in la la land, or it was then that it it, it was it was mind blowing. And so we've certainly come a long way as it relates to um, electronic forensics. And. Greg, what do you do um, in the practice when you approach um, an incident? Sure, uh, we've touched on this a bit. Um, and I, I just wanna go back to what Craig said a second ago in terms of the way that the police would handle this. So you have your, your, full, uh, your full imaging, which is slow. It's uh, USB hard drives, it's, uh, it's cables hooked up everywhere, uh, on and on and on. And if you have a thousand machines or 10,000 machines that doesn't scale well, to say the least, um, and so, uh, so what I do is, um, uh, is other than doing all those meetings, right? So we got through all these meetings. We know where the assets are. We know who the key stakeholders are. We know where the, the data is. We know what, in, what the compliance environment is because after this whole thing is done, all the people are going to be suing, all the lawyers are going to be defending, all the uh, breach coaches are coming in. The cyber insurance company is saying, well, we need this and this and this. Uh, there's your outside counsel, your inside counsel. There's all these requirements that are coming all over the place while the infrastructure is still burning down. So you have to take all these into consideration while you're thinking of how to roll out the technology to, to figure out where these uh, bad um, attackers are. Um, so you get that out there. You make sure that you're that you are working in tandem with the incident response team. That's that's over here. Uh, your your remediation team, which is probably um, uh, which is probably a combination of in-house IT, outsourced IT, and maybe a remediation company if it's large. Um, and then making sure that you are working together, collect appropriate evidence so that all those initial things are satisfied. Um, uh, again, uh, I'm just going to go back to the, the, the name you attest. I think the whole thing is like a testing. It's all documentation. We, we, everyone in this room has a lot of GRC background. So, um, so having, uh, having those SOC 2 style prove that you that you saw what you saw is kind of in our DNA. Um, and then, yeah, you uh, you achieve business objectives, you kick the attackers out, and uh, you make sure everyone is talking and staying in coordination the whole time, which means basically um, at least one member of, of each team is in constant meetings. So, Craig, this is a question for you. Um... If if a big player such as United Healthcare, who won't uh, change healthcare, falls victim to this type of an attack, you know, is there any hope for the rest of us? You know, what can we do better? Yeah, I actually think there's a lot of hope. I think there's probably more hope for us than there is the big companies because making a lot of assumptions here, but you know, we can be more tactical. We can learn from those big mistakes, and if it can happen to them, who I imagine have massive information security and compliance teams. Um, and they get they get compromised. Um, it just it, it goes to show that it, it really could happen to anybody. But for those of us that are smaller, have a little more control over what we can and what we can't do. Um, I, I think we're actually in a better position. I know in our situation now, we're in total control over the systems that we can patch, when we can patch them, what we can do. Um, we, we can measure our risk level better than some of these uh, these bigger companies. And and you know just just do just do it you know it's it's easy to say well we we don't want to patch or we don't think that we can do it now because of you know x y or z 
but you're going to have plenty of time to patch and do all of these things after you've been after you've had a compromise. And just yeah. one more thing that I wanted oh. to comment on uh, to, to Greg's comment about cyber liability insurance, which is a, a great comment. Um, the, the one bit of information I'd like to just share about that is make sure that your cyber liability insurance covers the companies that you bring in to do your investigation or remediation uh, because I've been in situations um, in the past where a company was breached. We brought in a whole bunch of players to do a bunch of work for us. And then our cyber liability insur insurer says, yeah, sorry, they're not on our approved list. So they basically didn't cover us. And Craig didn't know it, but he just did a plug for our uh, Audit Tuesday at Two's Weeks when I have a cyber insurance guy on. Okay, that's a really good point. I'll make sure we bring that up. Good, yeah. good point. And, and, and when and when you're having those conversations, when you're having those roundtables, uh, your your outside counsel, your um, your cyber insurance, your assigned breach coach, which is a lawyer, if you're not familiar. Um, they are all part of those conversations because uh, in the end, there's a lot of money at stake. There's a lot of assets at stake. There's a lot of liability at stake. And so, uh, and so those, those people need to be part of the table. And so, uh, no, so no surprises. Um, uh, I'm sorry that, that that happened to you, Craig, because that's uh, very expensive. Um, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that company really should have been more clear on, hey, let's make sure that we're covered under, under your policy. That's yeah. just my opinion. Yeah, you're spot on. Um, so Garrett, you hosted a discussion um, on the NIST Cybersecurity Framework 2.0 last week. Um, is that relevant to attacks like this? I, I think it's hugely relevant. Let me uh, take this back a bit. So what is NIST? NIST is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Just, and they are good guys. I had the fortune in this lifetime to go present to them. The years ago when I invented the first two-factor IDP and they were coming up with new guidances and that's what NIST does guidances around cybersecurity especially around identity okay so they just came up with a whole new cybersecurity framework that was you know published and people reviewed it for the last couple of years it's called CSF cybersecurity framework 2.0 and what they did and this is extremely relevant to the uh, beginning of this conversation there was always five tenants to the CSF identify protect detect respond, recover. Okay. What do they do? And that was what the other audit two is it. They added govern. Govern is this concept that, hey, bad things are going to happen. Okay. As Craig's accurately stated, right? That we've changed, right? It used to be in, in the other word I always say no is everyone used to say cybersecurity. No one says it anymore. It's much more risk is that these attacks are here. They're real. Okay. So we just have to be adults in a room and we have to do our, our, our work beforehand. And that's what govern is. Govern is saying, hey, not only do we have to protect, which obviously is one of the key functionalities, but who is monitoring the protection? Who's actually managing? Who actually is the people in charge of the protecting? Who actually is in charge of the identified, et cetera? Who's in charge of the, of the detection? Who's the respond? That has to be managed. We have to account that this stuff is going to happen. We have to take a risk approach, right? A risk approach, identify, and then quantify the vulnerabilities. And then, you know, uh, selfishly, yeah. I'm sorry. I just want to comment on that. And, yeah. you know, it's, I'm just as guilty. This is the next person. It's super easy to think old school where a lot of these risks are on equipment or things that we have control over. Like we can still walk into a room and touch them, but let's not forget what, do, what does our contract say for third parties? And the healthcare industry is so dependent on third parties that might have your critical data that um, when, uh, when, when something happens with a third party and they're doing their investigation, you're sitting there waiting because your maybe your clinical trial is on hold while they're doing their investigation or something's happening and your business is at a standstill because of some third party, you know, you've got to be able to make sure that you can either get the information, get updates or that you have, and that you have a uh, con contractual uh, language in place to, uh, to protect you. Yeah. And I couldn't help but share the uh, CSF 2.0 there for y'all. 
So, but it, 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 it just quantifies it. And it says, this is what we have to do. And it's in the answer to your question, Carrie, straight out, CSF and the other frameworks, not putting out any of them, they're all about the concept of, hey, what should we be doing in the inevitability of a hack, right? How do we, you know, as, as uh, Greg pointed out, you know, we've gone from just saying, oh, God, the world's to recovery. We got to recover, right? And if these places are in then our recovery is better. So, Greg, since you do both forensics and cybersecurity consulting, I mean, do you think the enterprises should adhere to, you know, frameworks to try to stay secure? Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to I'm actually going to say talk a little bit about IC, the IC3 guidance for Alpha B. Uh, if you want to look it up, it's a CU-000167-MW. It's about a year old, but uh, you'll see that the avoidance guidelines that FBI has the FBI has for this. So that's you have the indicator of compromise, then you then and then there's the and here's what you can do about it, right? Um, those guidelines on a real ransomware group. Um, they very, very closely match the um, uh, the implement, implementation guideline version one. That's like basically cyber hygiene, basic standards, uh, as defined by CIS 18 uh, risk control group. So uh, as far as a cyber risk framework, um, use use what makes sense because it's holistic. I really don't care if it's uh, if it's a, a NIST um, 800-53 or ISO 27001 or CIS 18, they're designed to look at all of your IT controls as a holistic environment and make sure you're not leaving giant gaps in there. So uh, so yeah, you it allows you to look at it from all the angles and that risk framework, whichever one you choose, uh, allows you to measure the, the state of the business, where you're at, where you wish you were at and your progress along that timeline. And all of that's important because cyber doesn't happen without support of your top leadership. So you can show your ROI, show leadership how you're doing, show leadership where your risk is, where you're progressing to, where you where you need to be, um, and they support you, they uh, they fund you, and uh, and then they make it part of the company uh, security culture. So you have to have a positive security culture. From I've been talking about every department in every department so that you can actually prevent this stuff from happening. This isn't about buying technology. This is about making the this a priority of the company. And this is how you do it. So if, with your experience in the private sector, do your, I mean, th you mentioned those um, frameworks, but um, do your enterprises follow industry and regulatory frameworks? And if so, um, which ones? Uh, I, I think I think I'm actually going to throw that one over to over to Craig. He's uh, he's living in the private sector. I'm in the uh, jumping around consulting sector. Sorry about that. Okay. Yeah. I think that was a me thing. Sorry about that. Yeah. No. I um. I, we do. So we actually follow ISO, and that's just because we're mm -hmm. uh, we have the uh, the potential to be uh, to have international business. And my experience uh, previously with with having running, you know, uh, a security company, not security company, but a security organization uh, within a, a, an international company was that um, NIST was great as a reference tool, but not so good international. They wanted something that was more internationally recognized. Um, and so what we did is we followed ISO and got ISO certified. But a lot of what the ISO referenced, like, for example, incident response or the risk rating all came from NIST. Um, but you know, NIST is a thing now, a lot of the new tools, they all follow NIST. So I, I honestly, I don't think that you could go wrong following one. And, and, and there's, and there's matrices where you can basically say, here is eight different risk frameworks. Um, and here's how they just, this control here lines up with this control here and there, because they're all saying really similar things. Um, they're just missing a few little pieces here and there. And like you said, in the, in a European uh, regulatory environment, it might be a certain way, or if you, or if you have, um, this isn't a, this isn't a cyber framework, but there are regulations that you do follow. So you got COPA to protect the kids. You got HIPAA to protect all the, uh, all the health. You got, uh, Graham Leach, uh, Bli uh, Bliley, uh, yeah. for all your, <laughs> and socks. So you have to layer in all the regulatory environment that you're in on top of the uh, the control frameworks that you're uh, putting in place to try to build that uh, holistic framework. Um, and Garrett, so you created um, the identity uh, governance product you attest. Is there relevance to ransomware in what you attest does? 
Well, I think so, but that's kind of, you know, irrelevant. The U.S. CISA thinks so. Okay, right? And that's, that's you know, the, that's the uh, cyber, cyber security Infrastructure Security Agency. They use security twice in that, only a government agency. Anyway, CISA, it is, look it up, it's hysterical. Okay, they state and they have a great guide and I just had our inside sales posted on a LinkedIn. It's called the Stop Ransomware Guide. And they say straight out, what should you be doing to stop ransomware? And they have great suggestions. You know, basically it is all about things like governance and, and practices and prep and all that. But one of the key identity principles that it lays out there is the principle of least privilege. It says straight out, if you don't know who has access to your resources, you are open to ransomware. Okay, you're you're just open. And and guys, the the thing is, it's natural. It's natural not to know who has access. It's a natural process. Greg and Craig both back me up. This called the, it's called privilege creep. You create an ID, rock and roll, and someone gets access. That's great. That's what always happens. I worked on a, a help desk to start my career, right? And how did people get uh, privileges? By yelling at me. Yeah, you know, my, my employee needs this. Give me this privilege. Bah, 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 bah. So rock and roll. You know, I just granted someone privilege or something, and I went over and had beers because I was in my 20s. You know what I mean? So what about those privileges? Did someone go back a week later and rescind those? Did someone review those? Did someone? Right. It, it doesn't happen. The no, I'll tell you what was, happened, Garrett. The next person that got hired that was in a similar role, Nice. Their manager said, give me the same access that that guy has. Yes. Now nice. it, right? Now it has a spawn. Yeah. And, and, yeah. And every single framework says you need to review privilege. So, you know, it, so, 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 so even if Garrett overprivileges someone back in his 20s, at the next review, it should be caught. So how are we supposed to do? I mean, that's the concept, right? The concept is we should be reviewing our privileges. How do you do that? Right? You're a group. You got, you know, 10,000 identities. You got 1,000. You got 100. It doesn't matter. Stuff all just is exponential, right? Because you got, you know, users and then you got your suppliers, you got your contractors, and they grow and grow and grow. It's called privilege creep. Okay? What you have to do is quantify this. And it's and it's listed out in, in this and everyone else. The, the current one is PRAC uh, um, AA 5. It used to be PRAC 4. Okay? What it says is all enterprises should review, should review their accesses, okay? And very relevant, all the stuff around this hack, the change healthcare, because it says you should be reviewing your access around EPHI, you know, electronic uh, personal healthcare information. How do you do that? You attest automated the process of reviewing any resource. So not only is it relevant to your constant maintenance of your enterprise, e.g. what you're giving access to, but it's also extremely relevant after the breach, Greg is called in and he goes, okay, I got to do an access discovery of this resource, this, this, this one. And you just turn on your test and rock and roll. You instantaneously can start reviewing. So that's hey, why Gary, you, me, you, yes. Let me comment on that because I think, you know, one of the selling points for me when I, when I bought you a test, was not only did it allow for that attestation, but it allowed me to push that attestation down closer to the people that actually had the accounts. And what I mean by that is um, for years, I was responsible for um, the IT portion of SOCs. And, and I'll just pick on, we were an active, we used Active Directory shop, we had uh, domain admins. And I was responsible for signing off on all the domain admins. But I was like, I was like a third cousin twice removed from the people that actually had these accounts. So I could look at them and say, yeah, this seems about right to me. But the people that should have really been assigning, uh, that should be signing off on those accounts was not only the, 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 the business owner, but more importantly, those individuals' managers. And, you know, using you a test to be able to push that attestation down to lower levels to say, is this real? Should these people really have it? Was the game changer for me. And, and, and I just like to, to, to add on to that, that if you do that for a relatively large company, that's a lot of managers 
that's a, that's, that's a lot of different um, little trees of, of span of controls that you have to be uh, be looking at. So if you're not doing it in a in a way that has a level of automation and a level of self governance, to where each of those managers can go in and do their own attestations, um, you'll have meetings over meetings, and no one will ever do an identity audit because it'll be too expensive. Because all of us all of us consultants, we bill by the hour, and so having a million hours of manager meetings to talk about who should have access to what blows budgets and that, that means that, that there's there's not enough ROI and the government and the um, leadership won't approve this so you have to have automations and efficiency in order to make this a regular uh, a regular tool that's used uh, a regular process that's done I'm sorry and Greg I don't know what I'm gonna stop bringing up solar winds but that's what that's what they're calling out now right after this stuff happens right the check boxing and that's what got solar winds in trouble that they they literally they said under 10Ks, they said under 8Ks that we have all these cyber practices, right? And then they got hacked, okay, which we all agree on this call is unfortunately an inevitability. Then the regulatory bodies did due diligence on them. And they pulled out the damn emails. The emails in the compliance products were basically management said, yeah, just say we got it, say we got it, say we got it. Yep. And that's unfortunately, that now is illegal. So that, that calls you out. Yeah, I, 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 I hate compliance for the sake of compliance. I actually want to protect businesses and nice. protect people and actually actually do the real deal. And this actually following compliance frameworks is very useful. Checking yes on an Excel sheet is not useful. So, um, so yeah, let's, let's let's just not do that anymore. Any of yeah. us. <laughs> um. So, you know, we've talked about elevation of privileges um, and compromised like credentials a little bit, but I wanted to ask you, Greg, do you think that, you know, the hacker's main goal is, you know, that they're aiming to compromise these um, credentials and identities when they try to break into these uh, enterprise systems? Is that their first? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, because they don't actually have to attack the company to get these credentials. They can they can attack another company. Or did you know that people sometimes reuse the same password? Um, so so you, all you have to do is go into a past breach, go to haveibeenpwned.com and see if your password has been reused or if your, your account's been breached on whatever website you shop at. Maybe it's a, a, a golfing company or something. It doesn't really matter. You, you find the breach off of that and you pivot it over to the enterprise. You pivot it over to um, United Healthcare. You pivot it over to uh, Sally May. You pivot it over to OPM. You know, um, all of these highly secure areas, they're just a pivot away from your local 5K fun run. So, yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, Craig, I know you talked about using you attests, but, you know, can you talk a little bit more about how your enterprise um practice security um, on its identity, including access review of privileges? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so I'm, again, managing our, the, the IT reviews for SOCs. And um, so we do a couple of things. One um, is uh, there's a couple of groups, mostly admin account, um, admin groups, but those are um, set up to trigger. So if anybody gets added to one of the groups that we monitor for, for SOCs, um, we get a trigger, we get a notification that the, uh, someone's been added to them, uh, which kicks off a campaign so that goes to the manager of that person, that person has to actually sign off that that that, uh, that addition is appropriate. But then every quarter we run uh, an, another attestation. So every service account, every admin account um, that we have, uh, we do an audit on and then the manager of either the, in, the human individual or the manager, the, the business, what I would say the business owner of, a, of an account has to attest that um, that level is appropriate and still um, and still relevant. And um, and it, so far it's been working out. Now getting the external auditors to buy into that, um, you know, took us a little bit of work, but we've actually we've actually turned the corner on it. And now uh, now we're now we've pretty much automated the whole process. So I, I know we've got about 15 minutes left. Um, I wanted to I jump over and see if I think we have a couple of questions from the audience. Um, uh, Greg, actually, the first one is for you. Um, what was the connection tool they used? Um, rumor has it uh, as secure connect remote access tool. 
Um, it's just a rumor. I, I, I think that's uh, that's possible. Um, they haven't released full reports. Um, we have basic basic attack IOCs, but uh, the specifics uh, have been pretty tight lipped so far. So not sure. Sorry. Yeah, Craig, there's I, agree. I, for you. Yeah, I couldn't find anything either. Yeah. Okay. Uh, there's a question for you, Craig, which is, um, what is the team's opinion on how uh, United Healthcare change healthcare um, scale and impact will drive Washington's decision makers to drive new laws, um, as we did with HIPAA? Oh I, well, there are the rumors that uh, they're already investigating. The feds have already stepped in and they're they're getting involved in it. Um, and so I, I think that you're going to see Washington come out with new legislation around this, which I, I don't always think is a good thing because I think they're so far removed from being able to write good law that I don't know how helpful that's going to be. I think it'll just create more check boxes as opposed to, um, you know, like real world uh, security measures. But I, I definitely think, and, and I, you know, the, a good example of this would be the 10K uh, requirements now that, you know, an officer has to, from an organization has to actually sign off on the risk. Um, I, I think that's a good example of the kind of uh, things you're going to see evolve from this. Yeah. And let me add on to that because, Gary, I posted something earlier this week on, on LinkedIn. I, I found an article that basically said that uh, the powers of be are going to try to get financial level regulations on healthcare data financial level of regulations you know basically saying we have to uh, this so that could be pretty ugly uh, and one thing i should add remember what people most people in this audience maybe you probably know but phi personal health care information is the most valuable data on the black market this is they said credit cards are like three dollars so security is like three dollars phi full phi is sixty dollars so yep. this stuff is valuable now you know if, if the regulations are going to help, I mean, like, you know, we got act a lot recently. So now we get, you know, four days, you have to do cyber disclosure. Is that helping? I don't know, <laughs> but it's the law, you know? Um, there's another question actually for you, Greg, before I go over to uh, Garrett, there's a question for you, but um, Greg, there's a website to check if your password has been breached. Um, can we maybe, I don't know if we should drop that into the um, chat. Yeah, I think Nausea is dropping it into the chat for us, but I'll let Greg, Greg answer. I just want to plug this website. Troy Hunt is amazing. He he uh, basically ran it himself, and now it's uh, sponsored by uh, Cloudflare. And very trustworthy. You can drop your email in there. You can drwp your password in there. It's haveibeenpwned.com. So haveibeenpwned.com. I have a link over there. Um, super amazing. They go on the dark web, they download all the breaches, they, they combine them, they, they aggregate them, they deduplicate them. And they, and it's an amazing tool that not only can you go on a website and just check for yourself, Hey, how am I doing? But you can actually build this into your cyber, cybersecurity intelligence workflow so that you can, uh, so that you can use that to help strengthen your environment. They have a little API to it. It's, um, really a fantastic resource. Everyone, um, is, is thankful for him for making this happen. That's a great question. Thank you so much. Um, and then Garrett, there's a question for you. Uh, how important will facial recognition be to reduce privilege? Uh, okay, well, I hate to say this, but I don't think much. Okay. I mean, because it, it, it's, let's take this back, you know, the three A's of, 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 of uh, cybersecurity, authentication, authorization, and audit going to old school here, right? Authentication is great. I don't care if you know you if this basically have to pull out the guy's liver and then you say this is my liver this is the guy okay and i got 13 patents in, in in two factors so i can talk like this or whatever it authentication is wonderful okay it is good it's a good first step it has nothing to do with authorization y'all it just doesn't help okay authorization is a whole nother game am i talking flippantly no i am not okay authentic authentication is what it is and the real people in security don't even believe authentication really is it's a better identity veracity you know if i can pull out the guy's liver i am going to be pretty you know thing but if it's going over the internet i'm still only you know maybe 80 percent sure because he could have just you know done a uh, man in the mill or a man in the browser or some other you know way to falsify the data authentication is great it doesn't solve all this stuff okay 
Because what is, is even a question I went to Greg and he answered is basically what happens is there's is all this other ways to get around the authentication portion. That's why the stop ransomware guide exists and says about principal least privilege. You have to assume that identities will be overtaken. And that's why we have to limit what privileges we're giving them. We can't wantonly hand out admins. And what that allows us to do is then to quant use our valuable time to review and continue reviewing the, the accounts that actually have all this privilege. And we monitor those accounts and we monitor when we raise the privilege. You attest to that. It monitors not only statically, but it arouses when, when they get raised. Okay, privilege escalation. It keeps that under control. So, unfortunately, as much as facial recognition is wonderful, is it going to help privilege creep? Probably not. You, you're still going to have to go, okay, I have an account. They're a salesperson. Um, I should be reviewing these and I should make sure that they don't have access to financial data. You're right. Is facial recognition is going to conduct uh, segregation of duties? No, I have no idea. It just says, here's the ID. Do it. Do what the hell you want with it. That's uh, a whole other. That's governance. Governance. I, I just, is want, I, you. Take it I just want to double. I just want to double down on the creep part portion of that statement because um, a lot of people they they mistakenly think that they set the permissions correctly when they first um, when they first uh, yes. created the user. Um, and they may have, they may have, Yes. but the thing is, is that, did you know that sometimes people get promoted or sometimes people get transferred to another department and the roles are now different. And sometimes those roles are, are conflicting. Um, I, I always use the same one. Uh, if you're in accounting and you started out in receivables and now you're in payables, uh, you shouldn't have permissions to both receivables and payables. Uh, that basically is a, is a, um, a recipe for creating shell companies. So, um, so yeah, uh, uh, role creep is the word, is that you started good and it got worse and worse and worse over time. A 15-year employee could have so much permission that they could single-handedly single destroy the company if their um, account was, uh, was abused. Yeah. Uh, so I think we have one last question, and it's for you, Craig. Uh, since this was a third party breach, how important is it for medical practices to have tested incident response plans so that they're prepared? Oh, it, it's probably like one of the most important things, if not the most important thing to do, um, you know, man managing your vendor. And it's, it's difficult because, you know, a lot of the vendors, they want to tell you just enough to get the business. But then when you really try and dig in to get the, the given the third degree, they're going to they're going to tell you whatever they want to get either a get the business or to keep the business but what's actually going to happen during the incident who like who knows um you know i had a conversation with the um the head legal at, at home depot years ago when home depot had their their breach and i know i'm probably dating myself on how long ago that's been but i said to him i said you you must have thousands of contracts with, with providers when you were going through your incident how did you how did you notify them he's like are you kidding we didn't notify anybody like we were so head down uh, trying to get our head around what was actually happening and how to contain it. We didn't, we could have cared less, uh, you know, about notifying them. We'll deal with that later. That's all fine and dandy. But if you're one of those people, like I mentioned, whose business is at a standstill while they're doing their investigation, what are you going to do? And so having these tabletop exercises and working through what your, you know, plan A, plan B, plan C is going to be critical to keeping the business functioning. Great. This has been really great. Very insightful. Um, uh, Greg, can you please tell the audience how to uh, reach you, if possible? Uh, absolutely. Uh, Greg at exacyber.ai or our website, exacyber.ai. Please, uh, please reach out. Thank you. And uh, Craig, can you tell the audience as well how to reach you? Yeah, just connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, put a note in the request that uh, you're on the uh, you're on this session. And so I know that it's not just a random sales request and I'd be happy to connect with you guys. And, and Carrie, how can people reach you? You did a great uh, job today. Thank you. Um, you can reach out to me um, anytime on LinkedIn or my email is carriejabs at gmail. Um, and and yeah, uh, I'll and wrap it up. Yeah. And, 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 and we at UATES can be reached at uatest.com. Just that side right there, right? Uattest.com or just write us at info at uattest.com and of course LinkedIn. 
Tim, this was a great audience. And Carrie, you killed it today. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank Greg. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, uh, well, we'll definitely talk more. Can't wait to hear all your experience, Carrie, one of these days. Yeah, anytime. Thank you. All the best. Thanks. Thanks.